So we're going to move into hearing from some, some local enterprises. And the Low Carbon Devon project is, is focused on supporting, empowering, and facilitating local change here in Devon, particularly focused on SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises, so lots of you who are in the room. Uh, so we're going to hear from a wide range of um, parts of the project. So the project is quite diverse. Um, so you may be coming to this event having engaged with myself, for example, or one of my colleagues, and may not know about the other bits of the project. So today is a, is a showcase of all the elements of the project. So it's quite diverse and varied. We think that's really important in terms of those different perspectives and how we can all learn uh, together. So I'd love to invite uh, my colleague Johnny up to the stage to introduce our first speaker and share what he's been up to. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the University of Plymouth. My name is Jonathan Bloor, uh, or Johnny Bloor, as you like, as you can see. Um, I am uh, a low carbon Devon research fellow, and I've been working in the area of power electronics and Mostly, my engagement with local Devon-based SMEs has been around creating energy dashboards, uh, online calculators, coding, uh, and also basic circuit design. So um, it's been a it's been a it's been an interesting journey. Um, but what's been really interesting is the emergence of uh, hydrogen in my story. Uh, engaging with a couple of local Devon-based SMEs that are interested in catalytic hydrogen for reducing emissions uh, and also m making green hydrogen. So I've been engaging with businesses in Devon that are in this sector and it's been great. Uh, and they're both here today. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to introduce you to uh, the, the first company. Uh, it's Jason Munro and Adrian Bartlett from Ecomotus. Over to you, Jason. Awesome. Well, an absolute privilege to be here um, and absolute privilege to help, uh, have a bit of help from Low Carbon Devon. Um, so, um, I'm Jason Moreau from Ecomotus and um, this is, uh, so we've got a little electrolyzer system which we can fit to any um, engine effectively, any fossil fuel engine and in, improve emissions. So, we can all do our bit to reduce pollution and emissions. We know we're not the answer. We are a little transitional process which we can uh, work our way through it. Uh, so, so no moving parts. These are the sort of, sort of vessels we've been fitting on, different vehicles, um, front loads in Plymouth. Uh, we've been working obviously with Johnny Blue, um, Low Carbon Devon, and he's allowed us to um, transition our electronics to a, a more sustainable situation. So now we've gone from etching our own boards to having printed boards, a lot more reliability, um, certainly helped us along our way. So, and also with our, our remote monitoring, so we can what, look at boats all anywhere in the world in relation lifetime and make adjustments and ensure they're running correctly. So I can't disagree with that. We're on our, our way to uh, highway to climate hell. Um, yep. Yeah. Let's do a little bit now about it. The Eco Pro Hydrogen Electrolyzer help the marine industry. So the, um, we've managed to save what, 1,278 tons of CO2 since we've started fitting on the boats. Um, so it's, it's a cleaner option. The engines stay cleaner, the pistons stay cleaner. So this is my, my high and die. It's 0 0.5 is the pass for soot, 0 0.01 and this year, too clean to register. So it says it all really. So, you know, this is a strip down of engine, it's got 30,000 hours on it, no carb buildup. So we're doing the right thing. This is a Kitty Petra out of, um, on the wind farm sector, it's running two V12 mans. You know, we're doing the right thing. It's happening. We're saving loads and loads of CO2. The Baron C, 13.2 tons of CO2 saved in the first week fitting. Um, you know, like I said, we're not the solution. We're just a transitional way forward. And I think that is our lot.
Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, um, Johnny, as well. Uh, but next up, we've got uh, Tom. So, Tom Murphy. Over to you, Tom. Cheers, Chris. Uh, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so um, introduction, I'm Tom Murphy, um, Greenwall's Industrial Research Fellow. So as Johnny explained and Chris explaining, um, we're sort of dotted around the place. I'm sitting over there. Um, so I'll be, over the last year, I've been doing some uh, research, looking at how we can optimize Greenwall's. Um, so and thinking about low carbon, um, sustainable green infrastructure in our, in our urban areas. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to work with people from across the university, uh, academics, students, uh, but also importantly, businesses. Um, and that's, I suppose, uh, taking me on to our, um, uh, so we've got some really good speakers with us today um, from the, who I've been working with. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce you to Carolyn Dare from Trim Plants, and she's a business, uh, uh, so Carolyn and Terry uh, have joined us today, and we've been working the, with um, Carolyn and, and Terry around biochar. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Carolyn. Thank you. So we're coming from Trim Plants. We're based on the Blackdown Hills in a very small village called Coombe Rally. Um, we first got to know Tom because he came looking for some plants for his green wall, basically. So at the nursery, we uh, had various discussions with him. Um, got interested in the green wall because, of course, Tom was looking at having healthy plants in small pockets. And as a nursery, we've been trying for many, many years how we could actually have really healthy plants in small spaces. So it kind of worked. Um, after lots of discussions with Tom, we decided actually, and me being involved in the climate emergency centres across the UK, we thought, why don't we set up the first land hub in the UK? So we set up the Black Downhills uh, eco hub. So that's uh, a partnership between Trim Plants, which is a company, the Black Downhills Transition Group, and um, Climate Action Taunton. So we've got a land and a town based CEC now. And we decided, why don't we look at actually making biochar? Because we've been looking around, and the farmers are using a whole load of brash, which is just cut every year, and it goes up in flames. You've got a whole load of CO2 escaping into the atmosphere. Couldn't we use that for something? So we started looking into biochar. Um, we managed to get a very old retort that was very rusty and in a field, but got donated it for free. So we started using that. And then we managed to get some funding for the Dartmoor dragons that you see here, which are kind of easier to use. So we're taking Dartmoor, so we're taking the brash that farmers use. There's quite a few farmers around the Blackdown Hills, so we've got a good supply. Um, Terry's also managing a, a, a woodland and there's a lot of ash dieback, so we're using that as well to make our biochar. We've made it into a community group as well. So we have the business, we have the community, and through Tom we have the research, which is great. Um, so we're processing the wood, so it stops methane escaping from a lot of rotting wood that we've had around from various um, uh, storms and all the rest of it over the last few years pyrolyzed biochar, so we heat it up to about 550 degrees, takes all everything out of it and you're left with pure carbon. So this is what we're putting into the soil. So our main emphasis is all about soil regeneration because these little pockets of uh, biochar actually become amazing um, habitats for microbes. And something we're missing from our soil is microbes. So this is why we're doing it, to have healthier plants um, there's a lot of other uses. I've been talking to people who are putting it into bricks for building now as well. They're using hemp to put into bricks and concrete. And it can also be used as an animal feed to reduce methane from cattle too. Uh, this is Matt, uh, another partner in this project who's um, setting up green walls. Again, using the um, pockets that you see at the back there um, and Terry's plants. And now we're mixing it with biochar. So in all the green walls, we're putting different mediums, and Tom's been doing a lot of research on the best mediums, what are the best plants, where's the thermal capacity, and it's actually increased with biochar, which is good news, and it's also um, actually really good for the health of the plants. Um, these are some of the plants that we've used, and I've actually planted about 60 pots with the same plants that are in the green wall, and I haven't watered them very much at all through the whole summer, so the biochar is actually 
kept the moisture as well. So the plants have stayed healthy. Um, we're now trying lots of different mixes because we have to activate the biochar before putting it in the soil. So we're doing it with um, nettles and different teas um, to get to that regeneration. And you know we've been really lucky to get two small businesses, as I mentioned, a community group plus research from Tom, all involved in this project. And our trials through this year, of course, plants take a long time to grow, so it's going to take a while. Uh, but from this year already, we've seen, at least in our trials, 10% of biochar is best for huge vegetables. So I had giant radishes. We had big green leaf um, lettuces. Tom's been using 20%, and then we think 30% might be better for slower growing trees or longer growing um, plants. Um, we're also selling it <laughs> now to, as starter packs, so people start using it in their own gardens. So we get biochar pushed out across Devon and Somerset. Um, and Tom asked me to think of a word, and I said, well, for me, it's about thrivability. It's not sustainability anymore. It's let's thrive, and let's see our soils thrive with all this uh, microbial activity. And so what we're hoping we'll do, you know, we're hoping to move on now to looking at the microbial activity in the root system. Um, and see if that actually changes the probiotic um, content of the leaf, because I think that would be something really interesting. And that's us. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Uh, we're going to change tack again, and I'm going to introduce my colleague Sepade to to welcome her to share what she's been up to. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sepide Korsavi, and I'm the Low Carbon Devon Industrial Research Fellow on Energy Efficiency and Adaptive Behaviors. Um, I have been working with uh, different enterprises from a wide range of sectors to improve indoor environmental quality um, by encouraging and facilitating adaptive behaviors and also reducing energy consumption and carbon emission by reducing set point temperatures um, of the heating systems in the offices and also um, improving um, a satisfaction of the occupants with the workplace by measuring their physiological variables. Um, I have worked with several enterprises such as uh, PSP, uh, Plymouth Science Park um, and Exeter Phoenix and TOTUS. Um, Gavin uh, from TOTUS is here today, so he's going to talk about his experience um, and collaboration with uh, Low Carbon Devon and also his role as the uh, sustainability and uh, renewable uh, manager in TOTUS. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from TOTUS, uh, Renewables and Sustainability Manager for them. Uh, we work on site at uh, Plymouth University as a contractor. We're in mechanical electrical, so we're quite a nuts and bolts sort of company. Um, I joined them in 2020, which uh, was in April, which was interesting. And um, we are currently doing the NEDEF unit uh, on site, and we're doing the intercity site. We helped do the Portland Square um, lighting upgrade uh, last year, which was to change all the lighting in the three blocks to LEDs. Um, and we also did the cobage fit out, um, which is over by the low carbon Devon site, which I'm sure you're going to see later. Is it gone? Yeah. Um, so as part of our race to net zero, we have now certified um, for 2040. Um, we felt this is achievable as a small business. We have three branches, uh, Bodmin, Plymouth and Exeter. Uh, we have 100 staff and this is where we've sort of set ourselves um, the target of. Um, we're going to try and achieve this. Uh, we've set out certain benchmarks um, for the last couple of years which we've um, achieved. We've now moved across um, to try and sort of accelerate that. So next year, we're hoping to uh, transition some of our vehicles from diesel vans over to electric ve vans. Um, we're transitioning some of our staff vehicles from um, diesel vehicles over to electric. Um, we're 
installing solar panels on our Plymouth office. We're also um, changing over to a fully 100% renewable um, certified tariff so that we're doing the best we can um, at our Plymouth office. Our Bodmin and extra offices are leased and we don't really have much control over where the energy comes from. Um, we recently had an intern from Falmouth University um, because it's one of our clients. Um, and what I asked her to do, we had uh, Shawlin. Um, she came uh, to us for four weeks and we basically, I asked her if she could look at a couple of products that we use which have got the claim of net zero or cradle to cradle circular economy. As a contractor, we take the companies at face value, but we don't know how they've actually got the claim for these products. So we asked her to look into that. Um, it's a bit small to, for yourself to read. Um, but basically, she looked at those um, products and found that, yes, they did qualify for it and they'd set their own parameters. Um, and then for the other two weeks that she worked for us, she looked at how we could integrate um, green contracts with our suppliers and contractors um, and how we can sort of tie in um, with them to achieve um, a more sustainable products for when we when we go to a job and we look at it, lighting for instance or radiators can we buy something better that's more sustainable and we know where that products actually come from and um, so she looked into those products for us and I think yeah that's about it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin, and thank you to Sepade. Um, so I'm now going to invite uh, my colleague Claire Piss up to the stage to talk about uh, the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. Thank you. Hi. Is that loud enough? Yes. Um, first of all, um, I'm Claire Pierce. I'm the project manager for the Low Carbon Devon project. So I'd like to just say welcome to everybody. And it's great to see so many people here today. So thank you for joining us. Um, the reason I'm here is to talk to you about the uh, one aspect of the project, which is the Devon Net Zero Innovation Fund. The fund has enabled um, eight Devon companies to work with our academics here at the university collaboratively. So the um, businesses and the academics will work together on a net zero project leading to the development of either a new product or a new service for that business. As you can see here, the eight companies are across a variety of sectors and the disciplines of the academics working with them is quite varied as well. For me, the great thing about the collaborations is it means that the business and the academic are working together on a practical problem. They're finding solutions together. They're exchanging knowledge, expertise and information and also building trust, leading to longer term collaborations. And some of those collaborations are starting to happen now. But that's enough from me. Let me now introduce you to Callum Robertson from Sage Tech Medical Limited from Paynton, who collaborated with Dr. Lee Durndall, who's over there, uh, from chemistry at the university. Good morning, my name's Callum Robertson. I'm here representing uh, Sage Tech Medical. So we've been around for, uh, since 2015, our Head offices are down the road in Paynton, so a local company, and we've been collecting volatile anaesthetic gases since 2020 and probably actually before that, and just before um, COVID and the world changed. Um, uh, naturally, uh, we collecting anaesthetic gases, we, uh, we have got the attention of anaesthetists and uh, were awarded a prize from the Association of Anaesthetists in 2020 and recently gained ISO 13485 as well. Um, so what, what is Sage Tech about? Uh, we are a, a, a company that collects anaesthetic gases. So to give you the context of that, um, when you go to all the hospitals in the world, they should have something called a anaesthetic gas scavenging system. Uh, the reason behind that is you're in a confined space in an operating theatre, and any of that anaesthetic gas, you don't want that affecting the surgeon that's uh, operating on you. So th this pipe sucks the anaesthetic gas out and vents it into the atmosphere, which not great considering that most volatile anaesthetic gases are incredibly potent greenhouse gases. So you can imagine all those hundreds of thousands of hospitals around the world are simply venting their anaesthetic gases. 
for every operation they have that they need to sedate anybody. So, um, and, and another issue with that is that your body doesn't actually break down that anesthetic gas. It actually, you know, you're talking about 5% of it is metabolized. So it's ideal for being reused. So we're, normally we just vent it out into the, out the window. So Sage Tech sort of sits in the middle of this, uh, this problem between the patient and the AGSS, and we collect that volatile anesthetic gas. We have canisters are loaded into our dock system here, where the volatile goes over, and, and it collects the volatile anesthetic gas. So we then collect these canisters, and then we uh, extract and purify the drug, ready for use by healthcare providers. So creating the ideal circular economy. So where does, where does Plymouth come in? Where does Lee come in? Um, our key interest for us is, the, is our catching material. How do we go about approving that? How do we minimize the need to change that canister, making sure that we're collecting all that anesthetic gas? Um, well, we're, we're a growing startup company. We're not as big as we like to be at the moment, and we have to, we have to invest selectively that gets us to market. And so the, the, the Net Zero Fund has been an ideal uh, fund for us for investigating those projects that we might not be able to invest in, the, 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 the ovens, the, the furnaces, the, the other equipment and training that goes with that's very expensive. So, I'd like to thank you for listening. Cool, thank you, Callum. And you can connect with them. So I'll hand over to uh, my other colleague, Emma. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you for coming. So I'm the Industrial Research Fellow for Creative Industries, which covers a quite a wide range of subsectors. And as part of the work at Low Carbon Devon, we've been working with a range of different SMEs, umbrella groups, in order to help um, organizations reduce their environmental impact and also communicate the message. And there are quite a few people here we've worked with, um, including um, Hannah Mills Brown of um, Make Southwest, who's the project leader we've worked with to, to develop the Green Maker Initiative. And Laura Wosley, the CEO of Make Southwest, is going to be um, telling you a little bit more about what we've done. Um, other projects that we've developed are the um, Net Zero Visions project, working with communities and creatives to visualize how communities can become net zero in their particular locations. And also um, the Creative Commissions program, which we um, worked with the Green Minds project and commissioned a range of different projects. And we'll hear from um, Vicky Putler later. So I'll just hand over now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emma. So Laura, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today, but she's pre-recorded a uh, video, which we're going to share with you. So just bear with me while I bring that up. Make Southwest is a craft education charity with its HQ in a grade two listed building in Bubby Tracy on the edge of Dartmoor. Our main aim is to champion contemporary craft and make it accessible to all. We do this by running a program of 15 free entry exhibitions of the highest standard of craft and design throughout our three galleries every year, supporting a membership of over 250 makers across the Southwest by providing both CPD and exhibition opportunities, selling in our retail gallery and paid workshop opportunities. Maintaining a varied education program for both children and adults by placing craft tutors in schools and community groups through our hands-on learning scheme, Free Hand, holding free and paid for workshops on site and online and providing a mentoring scheme for recently graduate creatives, to name a few. Paul Reed at Drift Advice supported us on a project called Future Fit, which was looking at how our organisation could be become more sustainable, aligning with our new strategy. Paul introduced us to Dr Emma Whitaker of Low Carbon Devon, and so the Green Maker Initiative, or GMI, was born. The GMI is free and it's open to any maker within the Southwest who is committed to reducing their environmental impact. 
makers are required to sign the pledge and produce an annual report. In return, they receive resources, access to a network of peers, an exclusive GMI button, a quarterly newsletter and dedicated events. The response has been extremely positive and we currently have over 160 pledge green makers. We exhibited Low Carbon Devon interactive map in which our makers were encouraged to add their location, craft discipline and method of sustainability within their practice. Low Carbon Devon has turned this into a digital map, which is accessible through our GMI web pages. The GMI logo was designed by Plymouth University students. The students were also part of the Low Carbon Devon internship at Precious Plastics Plymouth and Tavistock, which made our exclusive GMI buttons out of recycled single use plastics. The pledged green makers are asked to complete an annual report on sustainability with their practice to complete online. Low Carbon Devon created the report template and will be analysing the data as it's collected. We have had a decent number of reports submitted so far. Since the launch of the GMI, we have put on four separate events offering CPD and selling opportunities to our pledged green makers and educating the general public about sustainability and craft. Events have included a second sale, demos, workshops and a webinar. We have commissioned two films interviewing two of the pledged green makers and low carbon Devon, which commissioned a film documenting the evolution of the green maker initiative and telling the stories of a number of the pledged green makers. We are passionate about continuing the GMI and have many future plans, some of the short term being to continue to grow our membership, facilitate focus groups segmented by craft disciplines and provide three more selling opportunities with a sustainable focus throughout our 2023 for our pledged green makers. We have a couple of possible partnerships lined up, which we hope to spread the goals of the GMI on a more national scale. One being with a national university network on a project to support jewellers in making their practice fully sustainable. Low Carbon Devon are now creating a book about craft and sustainability with input from several makers and creative organisations, with an introduction by renowned writer and speaker Katie Dragedon. We have discovered that there's a real hunger for makers within the Southwest to learn how to become more sustainable within their practice, and our aim is to support them with their continued journey. Working with Low Carbon Devon has been inspirational, valuable, and empowering. And we would like to say a huge thank you to Low Carbon Devon and Dr Emma Whitaker. The word that best describes the world that we see in 100 years time is thriving for the planet and its inhabitants, our organisation and its legacy for the creative future. We need to aim higher just that we survive. We need to thrive. Round of applause. So just to set the scene, um, we have something part of Low Carbon Devon called Future Shift, the Low Carbon Devon Sustainable Leadership and Internship Program. So, so what is this? Um, so essentially is exploring how can we equip our students and graduates with the skills, the tools, the confidence and ability, as well as the agency to take action and be facilitators of change around climate action and people and planet. But what does this actually look like in practice? So this is a, a three month opportunity for our students and graduates to, to work, it's funded, to work within a local enterprise or local business to help them solve a real world business challenge that they've been working on. Alongside this, we run a series of weekly change leadership or sustainable development leadership workshops with the students and with the enterprise hosts as well to explore what is this leadership we need to rise to the real world challenges we face. So it's an interactive, immersive and collaborative experience for the students and graduates, but also for our local enterprise hosts um, to get involved in that program and co-create and build something to facilitate positive change. We've delivered nearly 40 of these opportunities over the last couple of years, and that's a range of businesses in varying size, but also sector, and also students and graduates from all different subjects and backgrounds. So again, fo fostering that sense of collaboration. So on that note, 
I'd love to invite um, up to share their story. Uh, first of all, uh, a local enterprise based here in Plymouth called Soundview Media. And uh, Gareth, Gareth Allen, is going to share with you their story. So welcome, Gareth. This is forward. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Gareth Allen. I'm the managing director of Soundview. We're a video and content production house based uh, right here in the city. And um, we, for a long time, had an ambition to go on a carbon reduction journey. We didn't have a Scooby-Doo how to do that. Also, we felt like we didn't have the time, we didn't feel like we had the resources, and we just simply didn't know where to go. Um, but luckily for us, Low Carbon Devon came along and uh, introduced us to the very, very talented Kelsey Parsons, uh, a graduate of this university. Uh, she just graduated this year. And um, she was our intern for three months with us. And we set a, that, that, that problem for us. How, how are we going to go on this, um, how are we gonna go on this journey towards net zero, or should I say net negative? And she did that, exactly did that. She looked at all of the things that we do and has put us on that journey uh, towards net zero, net negative. Um, but she was only with us for three months and she left us in August and we panicked. And it was my responsibility to make sure that we continued the really good work that she had started. Um, and then we get to the autumn where we are at the moment and we've heard about permafrosts today, but this is a word of the year. This has become the word of the year, permacrisis. And when we're in a permacrisis, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because we don't know what to do. What, what's, what's, what, what are the priorities here? I've got too many things to worry about. How do, we, how do we move on from here? And then this week, COP, this is from Monday's newspapers, COP started. Not a single mention of COP. Sun, biggest selling newspaper in the United Kingdom. Daily Express talking about pensions, the eye, surprisingly, talking about nurses, another red top, talking about Lord Lucan. The Metro, so the, the Sun is the biggest selling newspaper in the UK. This is the biggest in circulation. It's a free newspaper, has the biggest circulation. Not a mention about COP on the front page. Why do I talk about this? Because I'm a journalist. Someone asked earlier, <laughs> where's the media? Here I am, hello. I'm a journalist, I'm a broadcaster, I've worked in, um, in, in communicating for the past 30 years. And what Kelsey made me realize as an individual is I now have a responsibility to normalize the narrative around climate change, climate emergency, and climate reduction. Part of the way we're doing that, and something that Kel Kelsey helped us with, is uh, by being part of the Albert Carbon Neutral Sustainable Production um, initiative, which you probably have seen it on television programs, <clears throat> which means that we audit our, our productions and we make sure that our productions are uh, carbon neutral. But that means that we're not just talking about carbon and climate stories, but we are embedding that narrative into everything that we do. And that's what we all have to do. And that, for me, is my mission from here on in, yeah? So, how am I going to do that? I'm just going to normalize this conversation. It's not extraordinary, it's normal, and we have to get used to that. And one of the ways that we're doing that, sorry, unashamable plug, uh, we're running a tourism uh, conference this month. Um, it's called uh, Tourism for Good, Act Now for a Brighter Future. If you're connected with the, the tourism industry, if you want to know more about it, if you want a, uh, a code to get you a cheaper ticket, then come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Gareth. Um, and it's so important, isn't it, how we tell the story of today's world. So moving on from Gareth, we're gonna hear from another uh, internship host. Um, and then we're gonna hear from a few other speakers. And what we're gonna do next is a sort of quick fire 
one minute uh, talk. Uh, so we've set our, our next couple of speakers the challenge to share in one minute. Um, so I'd love to invite up to the stage uh, Tamsin from Dry Robe um, to share their story. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name's Tamsin. I'm the sustainability manager at Dry Robe. We're the original Change Robe brand and we recently became a certified B Corp earlier this year. Um, and as Chris said, we've been working with Low Carbon Devon on their internship and leadership program. So we were really lucky to have Neve as our intern for three months this summer. And her work was mostly focused around the circular economy as well as um, supply chain sustainability. So yeah, due to the experience, Neve did some extensive research for us and meant that we were confident in choosing who we want to partner with um, as kind of a take back scheme for dry robe to become more circular. And then she did a really great job with supply chain mapping as well to kind of work out where we can reduce our carbon footprint and kind of who we want to work with um, in terms of future suppliers going forward. So yeah, I would highly recommend the opportunity to anyone um, if you can take on an intern through Low Carbon Devon as it was a really invaluable and worthwhile experience for us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nice one, thank you. And for our next one minute, um, up next we've got uh, Vicky, uh, if she's in the room. Yep, welcome. My notes. Uh, hello, um, I'm Vicky Putler um, from the Flax Project. Uh, the aim of that is to reintroduce flax for fibre growing um, to create linen as an industry in the UK because um, we don't have it anymore. Um, uh, so uh, the idea is to go from field to fabric um, in a very small local area. So we have a field in Cornwall um, and a workshop in Plymouth. So uh, we farm the flax in a very medieval way in Cornwall at the moment. Uh, we have it, it's all done by hand because we have no, none of the machinery. Um, and then we process it in um, a workshop in Plymouth. Um, we also run an education program there doing um, workshops in flax processing, spinning, weaving, natural dyeing uh, and printing. Um, I did a Green Minds Commission with Low Carbon Devon and um, Plymouth Council and uh, this is, these are photographs from that um, commission. Um, it took place in Key and Green Places and we, um, we did a mini flax farm in the city and we took people of Kiam through the whole journey of planting the seed, processing, spinning, dyeing, weaving, and finally harvesting the flax. Um, and it's something that I hope to be able to roll out in, a, in other places in the city. Uh, I have a table over in the corner if anyone wants to talk to me later. Um, so our other things, words floating around in our minds are uh, small economy, locally produced cloth, um, uh, controlling the supply chain of our locally pr produced cloth so that it's clean and green. And um, looking forward, um, we want to partner with engineers or tech people to try and develop machinery that can help us do the processing, et cetera, uh, in a clean and green way. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> cool, thank you, Vicky. And Vicky's been working with Emma, my colleague who you heard from earlier in the creative industries side of the project. So now we're gonna hear from uh, two more people. So starting with uh, Gary Nicholson, who I'd like to invite up to share his story. Hi everybody. Um, giving me a minute to talk is a very difficult thing to do. I can do that, my introduction in that piece alone. So just to talk about my company, um, we're a green hydrogen company and it's been in, in um, startup mode for about 10 years. The technology is next generation green hydrogen. This is what the current stuff looks like. If anybody know, doesn't know what an electrolyzer looks like, this is a one megawatt current um, electrolyzer. 
what we're looking at is next generation um, moving down in cost and then third, third year out from near about half the cost of um, what electrolyzers are today. We've been working with low carbon Devon for about a year, I'd guess. We've had uh, Johnny Bloor um, working on the power electronics side of things. So these things here all need control. They all need different amounts of power. Um, solar power makes DC energy. We then turn it to AC. Well, electrolyzers don't need AC, they need DC. So we can do direct, direct coupling of solar to electrolyzers and save quite a lot of money in the process. So not only reducing the cost, but also improving efficiency. So that's me, Gary Nicholson. Cheers. Hope that was a minute. Cool, thanks, Gary. And finally, we've got uh, a final one minute. Um, so I'd like to invite Matt up to the stage. So Matt has been working with uh, Tom Murphy on the green wall side of things. So Matthew. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt McClelland. Um, I'm the director of uh, Western Durabuild. Uh, we're a construction company based in Exeter. We uh, specialize in residential construction, uh, groundworks, and retaining wall solutions. Um, as a company, a few years ago, we decided to explore the potential of incorporating plants into the building materials uh, that we use. Um, our aim was to not only uh, lower our carbon footprint, but also to benefit the built environment that we help create. Um, we at Western Geobuild are currently focusing our efforts on two living wall solutions. Uh, they are the Flex MSE retaining wall solution and the Phyto Textile living wall system, which you can see here, which was installed on the sustainability hub. Um, we've been working with Low Carbon Devon um, and Tom Murphy uh, to better understand our knowledge of the, of the living wall system that I mentioned, but also to learn more about the plants and the substrates that are used within the systems. Um, we also wanted to have some clear data that we could uh, relay to our clients to better explain the benefits of these living wall systems, primarily their uh, thermal performance, um, ability to improve air quality, and to help increase biodiversity. Um, through working with Low Carbon Devon um, and also Trim Plants, we've also discovered the potential benefits of biochar, which was mentioned earlier, and how it can be used as a substrate additive in order to uh, embed carbon in the soil and to sequestrate carbon through healthier plants. Thank you. <laughs>